Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. This is the final event in this semester's programming supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Earlier this semester, the traveling exhibit, Changing America, the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863, to the March on Washington, 1963, was on display in the Marvin Library Learning Commons as part of its tour across the nation to promote discussion and reflection on the ongoing American civil rights struggle. Lectures, film screenings, and discussions have rounded out our series, and I hope you've been able to attend some of those. Today we welcome award-winning author Steve Scheinkin, who lives in nearby Saratoga. He's the author of numerous books, as you can see here, intended for young adults who have the opportunity to learn more about American history and Mr. Scheinkin's engaging and accessible style. Mr. Scheinkin's book, The Port Chicago 50, Disaster, Mutiny, and the Fight for Civil Rights, was a finalist for the prestigious 2014 National Book Award for Young People's Literature. The book tells of a little known event that occurred while the United States Navy was still racially segregated in the early 1940s. The book serves as a reminder of the progress that has been made in the military to ensure fairness and dignity for all who serve, and yet also preserves the history of those who suffered and endured injustice based solely on their race. Please join me in welcoming Steve Scheinkin today. Thank you, yeah, I love talking about this story. I know it's not really well known at all. Um, but what I love about the job overall is that I get to skip around from all these different times and places from, from Benedict Arnold, who I know has a lot of good local connections if you've been to Saratoga, um, to this ridiculous story of Lincoln's grave robbers, these counterfeiters who tried to steal Abraham Lincoln's body, which it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually a true story, um, to bomb the, about the race to make the atomic bomb and all the spying that went on. And it was while researching that one that I found this much less known World War II story called Port Chicago 50. And kids always ask, because I'm much more used to presenting to kids where I, you know, how I got into this. So I go back to these early days and show me and my brother when we were young. This is where the, the idea to be a writer came from. But we always thought we would make movies together when we were this age. I'm the one with the, the big hair. He's the one with the bowl. <laughs> And we just, uh, we just dreamed about making movies. That was the kind of writing I always thought I wanted to do. And here we are making our first movie in, in Austin, Texas. And if this had been a huge hit, I, I'm sure I would be doing something totally different. But it was, I can show you the first review it ever got. I won't read it because it's too cruel. But look at the star situation down here. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, just a pan. And, and the movie really was just a rookie effort with all the usual mistakes you would find. But I still really wanted to be a writer. And that's what led me to... To, to history. I moved from Austin to New York City at that point and got a job writing textbooks. And it actually was a blessing in disguise uh, because it was great practice. You know this teaching that you need to do something for at least 10,000 hours to get good at it. I really buy that. And, and this was my more than 10,000 hours of writing. Uh, but also what was even better was that I kept finding stories. And basically all the good stuff that I would find they wouldn't let me put in textbooks. I don't know how well you remember your <laughs> school books, but there, there's really no room to tell stories. And so this launched me on this new career of, of telling stories, the same things I know we want young people to know, but hopefully in a more interesting and accessible and exciting way. And it was while researching this previous book, it was called Bomb, and it was about the making of the atomic bomb and the scientists who worked on it and the spies who stole the plans for the bomb for the Russians. And here we have a picture of this first bomb that they tested in New Mexico and what was left of the this 100-foot steel tower after they tested this first bomb. So I was researching that, and if, if it weren't for a ridiculous kind of remark that my brother-in-law, my, my wife's older brother, Eric, made at dinner, I would never would have found the Port Chicago story, because I'd never heard of it. It's really little known. And I was researching this, and he said he loves wacky conspiracy theories. Especially, I think he especially loves them because he it drives his own dad crazy. So he loves to torment his father with these crazy theories. And he came up with this when he said, oh, you're researching the bomb. Let me tell you something interesting, because do you know when they tested the first atomic bomb? 
And I said, of course, there was a New Mexico 1945. Everyone knows that. And he said, no, that's what the government wants you to believe. The real test was in this place called Port Chicago, California in 1944. And I said, come on, that is ridiculous. But I'd never heard of it, so I couldn't really refute anything that he was saying. But if he hadn't said that ridiculous thing, I never would have looked at the real story and found it. And of course, I started with doing Google searches, reading everything I could find, and there's really not much. You can do a search later, and there'll be a little bit more. The story's a little better known now, but Port Chicago, and it was a disaster. There really was a huge explosion in the summer of 1944 at a naval base called Port Chicago, California. So that much was right. His theory was, or this conspiracy theory was, this internet conspiracy, and it's on here if you go to, look, nuclear bomb theory was that this huge blast was, in fact, a nuclear test. The government had the bomb ready a year before anyone or history tells us that they did, and they tested it either on purpose, or this is where the theory gets a little hazy, possibly by accident. They were moving it through this base, and it went off. Either way, it was this huge explosion. We know it killed more than 300 sailors and Marines who were on the, the port. It was by far the biggest home front disaster of World War II. That part is true. But what caused this explosion? Well. The theory is that it was a nuclear bomb. And um, I'll just to give you one more detail about it, I checked out his website, the guy's website. Here it is if you really want to read more about the conspiracy. And the only thing I found suspicious, well, I found many things suspicious, but he said he, f he realized that this was true based on documents he found at a garage sale. So that kind of tells you a little bit about the research that he did. But we do know that the government has hidden many, many things from us over the years. So. It was intriguing, and I wanted to know what really happened at Port Chicago. And if you want to know, there was really only one book ever written about it, and it was this one called The Port Chicago Mutiny by Robert Allen. He was a professor at California Berkeley, and he wrote this book. And it's for adults, and it's, it's academic, it's accessible, but it's really not at all the kind of book that, that I was thinking of that I would write if, if I was interested in the story for younger, you know, middle grade and high school students. So I thought, wow, there's a real story here that I think maybe I could do something with. Um, here's Port Chicago. This is the Bay Area of California, San Francisco, Oakland. And if you go all the way inland, you find Port Chicago. It's this bleak looking stretch of land, but it is attached by water to the San Francisco Bay and the Pacific Ocean. So it was a very valuable place to put a naval base. And specifically, this base was all about loading ammunition. That's all they did load ships 24 hours a day with ammunition for the war in the Pacific. And the main characters in this story were the young sailors who were assigned to Port Chicago. And at this time, the Navy was completely, very, very strictly segregated. Guys would show up at training camp, and they were literally separated into white and black. And they lived in different barracks. They ate in different mess halls, everything. And some of these guys came from parts of the country that were segregated. And some didn't. So for some, it was really shocking. To some, it was what they were used to, but they expected better in the military, especially at a time when we were fighting a war, the president said, for freedom and for democracy. And they realized right away that that wasn't going to apply to them in this war. And these guys didn't know where they were going to be assigned, but they did know the policy of the Navy was no black sailors on ships. They said, we're going to only use white crews on ships we're going to accept black sailors. The Navy decided that, that was actually their idea of a concession to civil rights. Uh, it sounds like kind of a minor concession, but to, in their mind, all right, we'll allow white and black sailors, because up until World War II, they didn't even allow that. Um, African-American sailors could only work as messmen, basically as kind of servants aboard ships. And so they allowed blacks to enlist in the military and in the Navy, but not to serve on ships. So they had to do something, and they sent them to places like Port Chicago. And those are the characters that I follow into this story. Here they are at training camp. And this is Port Chicago. This is one of the few pictures we have of these guys marching out to the pier. And their job was they lived at this base, and they marched out to the pier, and they were just told to load ships with ammunition. No training. There was no manual. They got down there, and they realized there wasn't going to be any training at all. They were just told to figure it out as they went along, which was incredibly dangerous, of course, because they're loading bombs. Here's another one of the rare pictures we have. Some of them are 500 pounds or more, these bombs. And they realized that this was something that in civilian life you would need years and years of training to do this safely. And they thought, how come we're not being trained? And they realized that it was all part of the, the segregation that they were seeing in the military, that this was a job they were assigned. And 
it, it was a, it was an, ex the, it told them what the military thought of them, that they didn't bother teaching them how to handle this stuff safely. And sure enough, this is what led to this explosion. Now, to this day, we don't really know. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows what happened, but there was some kind of accident at the pier. These guys were loading, and they were being rushed all the time. Their officers were constantly rushing them, even racing one division against another. They bet each other, the officers, though they later denied it. There was a lot of evidence that they bet each other. My division can load faster than your division. So you have these guys who are untrained, being pushed by their by their officers to load as many tons as they can a day. And they, the guys knew something terrible was gonna happen. They knew it and they complained about it, they asked for training, they asked for more safety regulations and they were just denied time and time again. And sure enough on a night, on this famous, infamous night in 1944, there was some kind of accident at the pier. It was about a little after 10 o'clock at night, but they worked 24 hours, three shifts a day, and something caused this huge explosion. We know there was a ship at the port that had over 5,000 tons of ammunition and bombs already loaded onto it. So in terms of the explosive force, it was not quite as big as those first atomic bombs, but kind of, it was in the ballpark of those, um, which kind of, I guess, is where this crazy theory came from. But we know there doesn't need to be any conspiracy. There was tons and tons of ammunition on this ship. Something went wrong, and it sparked this huge explosion. And everyone who was working at the pier was killed instantly. And that's where the over 300 young men were killed instantly. So there are no witnesses who survived who actually saw what happened. Um, there's some ships, some pictures of the, the ship. This is what was left of the ship that had the ammunition. It's pretty dramatic. Um, and these are, you can see, official photograph not to be released for publication. These definitely did not make into the newspapers and were not released until decades later. But you can see what this explosion did to the pier and the base, and the barracks. This is very interesting because this was a mile away. This was a mile away from the waterfront, which gives you an idea of how powerful this explosion was. But the guys who are the main characters in Robert Allen's story were, had just gone to bed. Their, their lights out was 10 o'clock, turned the lights out, but they weren't sleeping yet. They were lying in their bunks, writing letters. They were in the bathroom, thinking about a date they had the next day, just very normal things when this explosion occurred. And a lot of them were injured by flying glass and of course the falling building. Nobody was killed that far away, but they were, a lot of them were injured. And they were taken to a, well first they had to clean up this base. They were given this gruesome assignment of cleaning up the base. They found a lot of, mostly parts of bodies, not very many actual bodies. And these were their friends. And then they were taken to another base, but they weren't told what was gonna happen to them. They knew though that they were gonna be put back to work doing the same exact thing in the same way. It was another base in the Bay Area and all they did there was load ammunition. And that's all these guys had ever done. And so they knew they were gonna be put back to work in the same way, under the same incompetent offers, officers racing each other, and that this kind of thing could easily happen again. So they had that on their minds. They had dealing with the, the trauma of seeing so many of their friends killed, dealing with the obvious injustice that was going on in this war, again, that the president kept saying we're fighting for democracy, and they did not feel included in that at all. In fact, they would go there, they told some very specific stories of going into bars in, say, Oakland or San Francisco. You think of this happening in the Deep South, but it happened everywhere, and, and being refused a beer, even in their uniforms, in their military uniforms. Um, so they knew that a lot, there was a lot wrong with what was going on. And this is one of the characters that one of the people that Robert Allen featured, his name is Joe Small, and he was a young guy from New Jersey who was in the barracks that night and was slightly injured, but not too badly injured. But what makes him so interesting is he was just a natural leader. Even before the explosion, the other guys in the barracks looked up to him. He was a little guy, but he was very forceful and he was very intelligent, and he was one of the few guys who would speak up to the white officers, and he wasn't afraid. And so guys always looked to him, can you tell them this? Can you tell them? And he said, I don't want to get involved, but they kept coming back to him. He was just a natural leader, and in any, in any fair system, he would have been officer material, but that wasn't open to him here. But he was informally kind of their spokesperson. And so they all went to, to Joe at this point and said, what are you going to do? We, should we all go back to work? And he specifically said, I'm not going to tell anybody what to do, but I'm not going back. And that led to this incredibly dramatic moment when they, a couple days later, they started to march them down to the pier 
And they didn't, still hadn't told them what they were going to be doing. But Joe and these other guys knew exactly where they were headed. And when they got the order, column left, which was a turn left down to the pier, they stopped. They just stopped in the road. And the officer that was marching them got furious with them and said, are you going to go back to work? And some of them still hadn't made up their minds. Some wanted to go to work because they didn't want to get in trouble. Some, like Joe, decided he wasn't going to. And throughout the day, other divisions did the same thing. So by that afternoon, several hundred people had refused to go down to the pier and load ammunition. And this became such a big deal that an admiral came zooming up on a jeep. He got them all together on a baseball field. And they all described this very dramatic scene where he jumps out of the jeep, he's furious, starts screaming and cursing the second he gets out. And basically he said, I think that you guys are all guilty of mutiny and I'm going to see that you're all shot. And that was, they, did, they thought, mutiny, isn't that where you take over a ship or something? But legally, the way it's defined, mutiny trying to usurp powers from your officer, it's the most serious crime you can commit in the Navy. And it is punishable by death, potentially. And so these guys said, whoa, that is serious. And they did not necessarily expect fair treatment from a justice system. Um, so when they heard that, most of them decided to go back to work. I think understandably. But you have to remember that a lot of them were teenagers. Some of them were 17. You could enlist in the Navy at 17 with your parents' signature. So a lot of them were 17, 18 years old facing this decision. And I think when I tell this story in, in high school, that really hits home. Like, wow, what would I do in that situation? It's almost impossible to imagine, but uh, it was a life or death kind of literally situation. And most of them decided to go back. As much as they hated it, they decided to go back to work, which I think is totally understandable. But Joe Small and several others refused. And throughout the day, a few other people refused until it got up to 50. And that's where the name Port Chicago 50 comes from. That was kind of their informal tag that the, the newspapers gave them at the time. So 50 people still refused to go back. And they were charged with mutiny. And there was a mutiny trial held really, really quickly. In fact, they were assigned lawyers, but they didn't even get to meet with their lawyers before the trial gives you an idea of how fair this trial was going to be. And they had, this is, as far as we know, the only picture of it. It was in a, an old marine barracks in San Francisco Bay. And you can see the guys in the back in their blue uniforms. And then these are their lawyers who, who really did, actually, when you read the transcripts, they did a really good job, but they had no time to really prepare for the trial itself. But it sort of disappeared from the newspapers at this point. This is the summer of 1944, so D-Day is going on and all these other things. And it, the story gets harder and harder to research as you try to find out what happened. You can see now it's no longer a headline story. It's kind of buried in here. And from that point on, as the trial went on, it just got lower and lower, and the articles got smaller and smaller. You can get the transcript of the trial. It's over 1,400 pages, single-spaced, legal-sized pages. And you can, send a, you can get it from the Navy if you use the Freedom of Information Act. It's been declassified. You still have to f jump through these hoops, but they'll give it to you. And if you read it, it does not sound like an episode of Law and Order you know, or some kind of courtroom drama. It's, it's very boring and procedural. They had told the guys, their lawyers told them ahead of time, um, you're not allowed to talk about racism. You're not allowed to talk about unfair treatment in the military. You can't talk about unsafe working conditions. You can't talk about incompetent officers. And they were saying, that, that's what this is all about. But the, tr the authority said, no, it's all, the only thing that matters is whether you, you refuse to go to work or not. And that's what the trial kind of focuses on. But a few times, these guys went off script. Once they got on, on the stand, they spoke their mind on the stand. So there are these few moments. And that's an interesting thing as a researcher is to go through and find those tidbits. And it takes weeks to read the whole thing. So you really have to be dedicated to find these things. Thurgood Marshall got involved. He later became famous, of course, as the, because he joined the Supreme Court. And he was the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court and was this great civil rights lawyer even before that. And he got involved. He was young. He was in his early 30s. And he was a lawyer in New York City. And he heard this trial was going on. And he flew out to California and really felt like, in his words, that they were being railroaded. And he decided to get involved. And he wrote briefs. So you can read those as well. And that's another source you can find. But ultimately, I just couldn't find that much. And I looked at the back of uh, the book. You know, you always want to look in the back of the source notes of a book to see where that author, that scholar got the material. And maybe you can track down those little clues. And this was one I'd never seen before. See, it says primary sources, 
And this is Robert Allen and his book. It says, Interviews with Port Chicago Survivors, 77 to 85, in possession of the author. And now you think everything is either in a, well, we expect everything to be online these days. So here's something you can't Google because it doesn't exist even not only online, but not even in an archive somewhere. It's in, in possession of author, whatever that means. And I realized as much as I was intrigued by the story, I couldn't tell it unless I could find those interviews because I felt the only way to tell the story in an interesting way or the best way would be through the eyes of those young sailors who were there. What was it like to show up in the Navy? What was it like to have this, to work at this base? And just those little details that you want in any story to really make it come alive and have characters. Because in nonfiction, characters are just as important as fiction, I think. And so I started first by emailing Robert Allen and telling him I was interested in the story. And we went back and forth a little bit. And he asked me to send him some of the things that I'd written. I think he was just kind of checking up on me to see if I was serious. And eventually he said, all right, well, give me a call at such and such a time. And he talked me through the story and what he had learned and what there was out there, which is not much about it. But he's one of those guys who, once he, once he decides he likes you, he just goes all in. He goes from being you know, just polite to being your uncle, basically. And he said, all right, here's what you're going to do. If you want to tell this story, and I think it's great to tell this story for teenagers, it's, it needs to be done. It's never been done. So it was, he didn't ask if I wanted to come. He said, you're going you're, you're to fly out to Oakland on this date. I'm going to pick you up at the airport. And you're going to stay in my apartment. And I'm going to take you around the Bay Area and introduce you to all the people who are still around who were involved in this disaster and, and mutiny in the trial. Um, and we're going to go out. There's a memorial every year in July 17th, which is the day of the explosion. It's still an active military base, but you can go that one day. And there's this one little waterfront area, which I'll show you, which is a, uh, a, parks, a park now. And you can go down to the waterfront. And he said, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to show you everything. And he never said, I'm, and I'm going to give you my notes. I'm going to give you all these interviews that I did. But I was hoping that was going to be part of the deal. I didn't want to push my luck. So I said, yes, all right, I'll come out. And he, he absolutely did all those things. And I'm just going to switch gears a little bit and tell you how he found the story. Because in the process of getting to know him, I wanted to know, well, wow, this story is hard to research now with Google in 2012, whenever I was doing it. What was it like for you in 1970? And he said, oh, well, let me tell you. And this is the story that he, that he told me. He said, I was a grad student at Berkeley, broke as any grad student would be, and I was interested in African-American history, and I was going, he was a journalist as well, and he was writing, I think it was actually in his, his work as a journalist, part-time, that he came across this mutiny. This is a, a pamphlet put out by the NAACP during the trial. The real story of how the Navy branded 50 fear shock sailors as mutineers. And it's just a few page pamphlet, no, doesn't have any byline or anything, but it told the basics of the story. And that was the first he'd ever heard of it. He came across it by accident in this library, and he made a copy of it. And he was busy with a million other things, but it just really stuck with him. So he started looking, I want to find out more about this. And he looked in this classic books like this, this one by John Hope Franklin, classic books about African American history. And he said in this one there was one or two lines, which he later found out were not even correct. You know, that there were the guy got the story wrong, and it was such an obscure story, he just kind of referred to it quickly and moved on. He looked at old newspapers, and the old newspapers did have the story. It was such a big deal, especially the explosion. But you can see 50 sailors face trial for mutiny. So he read those, but those are really superficial and don't at all tell you uh, the story from the point of view of the young sailors. Nobody talked to them. Nobody bothered to get their opinion or their story. And he looked at the court-martial transcript. He was probably the first one to ever do this, to go to the Navy and say, will you send me these transcripts? And they eventually did. And they, when they sent them to me, they sent them as PDF files. But when they did it to him, sent it to him, they sent him as these giant binders, which he showed me. He still has them. Really intimidating to start looking through them and trying to find, make some sense of it. But if you look at this, just look at question 169. It's totally routine. Where are you from, Saunders? And this apparently is indicates that the information is classified or redacted because it's personal information about naval personnel, which is not made public. 
So he was going through this, and what he was really looking for, in addition to the details of the story, were he wanted to know where, these, where he could find these guys. Because at this point he realized the only way to get the story about what happened at Port Chicago is going to be to find them. Now he knew they were all convicted of mutiny. There's a little spoiler alert. But they were all convicted. They were not executed as that admiral told them they were going to be. But they were given long prison sentences, eventually let out, thanks in large part to Thurgood Marshall's work. And then kind of the government just wanted to disappear. So these guys kind of drifted back to their lives and just went, tried to pick up the pieces and go on with their lives. But nobody had any idea where they were. And even the transcript doesn't tell you where they were from. If it had said Detroit or something, he could at least look in the phone book from Detroit. But without that, where do you even begin? And he called the Navy. This is the Navy's Naval Yard and offices in Washington, D.C. And he said, I, he looked at phone books and he even tried, he said, maybe there's some in the Bay Area. Let me look up these names, but you know, there's just many of them common names. And he actually made some phone calls, but it just was, he realized right away that this was going to be hopeless to try and track guys down through, through phone books. And so he said, the only way I can get the information is directly from the Navy. I think this is just like a great old fashioned detective story. And he wrote to them and they said what they always say. They said, we don't give out um, personal information about names or addresses or anything like that. And he pleaded with them. And then some guy, this is another one of those twists that if it hadn't happened, this story would, would be gone, I think. Some clerk in the Navy decided to go off book, I think, because I don't think he was supposed to do this, but he said, oh, all right, let me tell you, here's what I'll do. I think he liked what Robert was trying to do, maybe, and he said, I cannot tell you these guys' names. I'll be getting so much trouble. I can't tell you where they live. But if you tell me, if you write them letters and send them to me, I will forward them to these men. And if they feel like talking to you, they'll get back to you. And that was the turning point in the whole story. And uh, he did. And he wrote to dozens of them. And he got maybe about 12, he said 10 or 12 of them, wrote back to him. It took months, of course, because these are old-fashioned letters. And he started calling them. And several of them agreed to talk to him. But then he had this problem that he was completely broke grad student and they were all over the country, mostly in the East Coast and down into the South. And he said, I, I don't, I, he had enough money to fly from New York, San Francisco to New York, but that was about it. And then he realized there was a, you could buy what they called the, what was it, C, the Sea America Pass or something like that? <laughs> Are you nodding? Do you remember that? Uh, he said, I looked in the newspaper and it said, Sea America for $100 you could buy a, a month long or some 30-day pass, something like that, to go anywhere on any bus, which is, the, you know, not a glamorous way. But he said, I don't care. I, don't, I won't even stay in hotels. I won't even sleep. I'll just take the bus everywhere. It was a terrible plan, but he was just so excited about the detective work. You know, he didn't really think about the details of it. So he did. He flew to New York, and he started meeting these guys. And these are some really dramatic pictures of some of the men he met who hold, holding up the pictures of themselves as sailors and, and today. In them. But what was really st striking to me was he said the first, the very first interview he did was really close to being the last one. He, it was in Harlem, the first one. So he, he went to this guy's apartment in New York City and the guy came to the door. He was probably in his 40s by that point or something and he said, yeah, all right, I, I'll talk to you but let's not do it here. He kind of closed the door and they walked to a neighbor's apartment and, and did an interview and he got out his tape recorder and this is old-fashioned you know like tape recorder like this gets out the tape recorder and they talk for maybe an hour but Robert felt that there was something awkward about the fact that the guy wouldn't let him into his house and so they talked for an hour an hour and a half and the guy told him his story and Robert said gee you know I still feel weird about that that moment I hope I didn't make any trouble by coming and talking to you today and the guy said no not you didn't really make any trouble but but my son is home today, and I've never told him what happened to me at Port Chicago. In fact, he'd never told his wife what happened to him. And as Robert, that really hit him, like really hard. He said, whoa, what am I doing? Do I have a right to be doing this to these guys? If they've buried this story so deep, should I be dredging this up again? And he, just, he said he spent a sleepless night at the Y in uh, YMCA in in New York City, just should I do this? This is, I'm re-traumatizing these guys. On the one hand, I have to, he so passionately wanted to tell their story, but on the other hand, if they hadn't even told their wives and children about it, did he have a right 
to ask them to tell it. That's, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, but he said, oh, look, I've come all this way. I've blown every cent I have. Let me just do one more. And the next one, the very next one was in New Jersey, and it was Joe Small, who was the guy the Navy decided was the ringleader of this mutiny. And he said if it had been anyone else, anyone he had talked to subsequently, he would have quit. But Joe was so enthusiastic about it, and he was still that same guy, that same leader, intelligent spokesman, that when he met Joe, Joe said, yeah, let's get this story out there. And so Joe became the one he talked to the most and gave him leads to talk to a lot of other guys around the country. And he ended up traveling all over and interviewing these, these, these men. And if he hadn't done that, these, these stories would be, literally be gone. As far as we know, all 50 of the men who were convicted of mutiny are dead now. And so their stories would just never have been told. And I think it's heroic what he did, collecting these stories and put just a fraction of what he found into his book. He, this is just from Oakland. This is the park. There's a tiny, it's the weirdest national park in the country because it's on an active naval base and you have to go through the base and get permission and checked out and everything. And then they take you down to the waterfront and there's this tiny, tiny national park where there's a few little signs. You can see the pier, the pilings that held up the pier that blew up that day. And some of the train cars, they used to load ammunition and put them in these cars in these bunkers in case something went wrong. And they, you can still see remnants of what the old base was like. And here's Robert, he speaks there every year, he still does, at the waterfront. And this was really dramatic, I got to meet, since none of the men who were alive at the, who were, out, some of the men who were at Fort Chicago and survived the explosion were still, are still around and were at the, the meeting. But most of them aren't, and none of the mutineers, so-called mutineers are, but some of their children are, and they're still working on the story, they're still working to tell it and hopefully to eventually get these men exonerated. And this was Spencer Sykes, who was the son of Spencer Sykes Sr., and he was able to tell me stories, and he actually had recordings of things that his dad told him, and again, those details that, not just to get the history right, but to tell a really good story. You really want those details. He told an amazing story about him. He was lying, he was planning to spend that day, that night that the explosion took place. He was just gonna be home. He had that night off, and he was gonna lie around reading. But at the last second, this woman who he'd met in, o in Berkeley, or I think it was her mother. Yeah, her mother called the base and said, hey, what are you doing, Spencer? And he said, nothing much. He said, do you want to take my daughter out to the movies? She was trying to set them up. And he said, oh, yeah, okay. I don't think he was super excited about going out with her, but he said, all right, why, why not? I've got nothing else to do. And he went to the movies with her. And when he came back home, there was a huge shard of glass through his pillow uh, where he planned to be, have been spending that night. So those kind of stories that never would make it into a history book this guy, Spencer, had them, you know, he had recordings of his dad telling these stories, which is just amazing. And then the, the, the best moment of my writing life in terms of the research I've done was when Robert finally took out this box, this magic box of oral histories that he had done, and there really are thousands of pages of them. And he said, all right, now it's time to go to the copy shop. And he just had these stacks and stacks of papers, which I'm sure will end up in the Berkeley archives eventually, but for now, they're really just in his house. And he, uh, we just made copies of everything. And it has all the Joe Small interviews and all the, about 10 or 12 other people that he interviewed very extensively. Where you, you know, telling childhood stories, how they got into the Navy, what they, what they felt about the segregation that was going on. And everyone's different. There's a really diverse group, different educations, different backgrounds. Um, so this is priceless, the stuff he had. Most, he had more with Joe Small than with anyone else, which was great because he really, he wants to be the main character in this book and he really is. And so that's the story of the making of that book. Um, it was interesting, kind of full circle thing. This guy who came up with the conspiracy theory wrote to me. He said he, he found this news alert that the book was coming out. In the book, do you get into probable causes of the explosion? Particularly, do you discuss, ponder my take on the cause? And I had to write back to him and say, no, I don't really get into that ridiculous. Um, but if it hadn't been for that crazy theory, I never would have found this much better story. And what's really powerful about it is that it's still going on. Last year was the 70th anniversary and I went out there and went to this symposium and did a talk there and we're still working to get the Navy especially, because it has to come from the Navy, we th to overturn these convictions. All these men lived their entire lives as convicted mutineers, which you can imagine what that did to their career opportunities. They were denied the GI Bill and other things. Um, one of them went 
to President Bill Clinton in the late 90s and asked to be pardoned. Um, several others, lawyers had approached them and said, do you want to try to apply for a presidential pardon? They said, no. Why should we be pardoned? We never did anything wrong. We never broke the law, in our opinion. So we, don't, we, don't, we should be exonerated, but not pardoned. But this one guy wanted it. He said, I just want to do it. It'll help keep this story alive. And he did. And, and Clinton did pardon him. But, so the other, the other, but that doesn't wipe out the conviction from your record. So it's still going on for all 50 of them. And many of their families are involved in this effort. Here I am with Robert um, to get these convictions overturned. And there was really just recently, if you want to find out more, follow the story. There's this organization called the Friends of Port Chicago. And they're still working on it and put out newsletters and press releases when they are doing something new. And they have an effort going on right now. Just recently, that they sent a letter, which I was able to sign on to, to President Obama about this case. And of course, he has a million things going on. I don't even have any idea if he's looked at it. It seems like the kind of thing that he would take an interest in if he gets around to it. Um, but the, the California senators, this is just from September 29th of this year, so it's very much alive and well, have been urging President Obama to bring justice to the wrongly convicted Chicago sailors. So we're hoping that still something will happen to not just to keep the story alive, but for the families who want to see, in their mind, justice done for those 50 convicted mutineers. And that's the story of this book. I'd be happy to talk more about it or take any questions. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I understand yeah. the yeah. That's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, the Navy treated it in a strange way. They once they sent them all to prison. They mostly got 15-year sentences in, to prison. Some got a, a little bit less. Um, Thurgood Marshall kept the pressure on. Eleanor Roosevelt kept pressure on. Actually, she got interested in this story as well. And so Secretary of the Navy, Forrestal, decided he just wanted to make it go away. And it wasn't long after the war that he decided, I'm just going to let these guys out. But what he did, but they did a strange thing, which I think is interesting. They, they said, well, they're still in the Navy, so they have to serve out. We want them to serve out their time in the Navy in the military, and they put them back on ships. These guys, Joe Small served on a ship that sailed all over the world, which tells you that they didn't think they were mutineers, obviously. They wouldn't have done that. And then they, they, uh, they, weren't, they were all discharged under, I guess it was called, under honorable conditions. Other so it wasn't a dishonorable discharge. Other than honorable. Other, yeah, and so they, were, they got some benefits, but not the really important ones. And, and that was never changed. Yes, exactly. Right, it wasn't dishonorable, which is interesting, because they did disobey orders in time of war, which is just about the most serious thing you can do wrong. Um, uh, it was interesting the way they treated them. They obviously didn't think they were dangerous mutineers. Uh, but what, what I think the families really want to see is to have those convictions overturned at this point. And the Navy has taken notice a few times over the, over the decades, but most recently, maybe 15 years ago, they looked at it and they just decided it was just too late to, to look, let's just, uh, we don't want to reopen this case, I think is essentially what it came down to. And I mean, at the time, to the Navy's credit, they really did respond proactively, especially to what happened at Port Chicago. And there were other racial incidents at naval bases and they decided to, to desegregate. It was considered an, a really bold experiment because they did it in 1946, they started during the war and then continued. And I remember learning in school that it was a really big deal when President Truman signed an executive order desegregating the military, and that was in 1948. And that was a really big moment in the civil rights movement, which is true. But what, what I never learned 
was that the Navy did it first, and they did it largely in response to the Port Chicago incident. They, they never came out and said, this is partly our fault, but I think that they realized that, and they said, we can't afford to keep having these kind of things happen, so maybe let's just try to start integrating and see what happens. And they did, and it went much more smoothly than the naysayers had expected it to. And so they just went ahead and did it. And that really influenced the other branches of the military, which is a really interesting little side story that I never heard. Yeah. Oh, sure. I think they will. I really, I mean, I've met them and they're, they're pretty feisty. They're really serious yeah. about it. And I think they're really, I don't know, even, I mean, this would be a question for a legal scholar because pres the pres even the president can't overturn a conviction from the Navy. That has to come directly from the Navy itself. Uh, but there, there are things, there, maybe there are other things he can do and you know, whenever he signs an executive order, people go crazy and <laughs> think he's abusing his powers. This seems like one that would piss off certain people if he did it, but uh, I don't think that would bother him at this point. So, that's what that's what it would make it very. I mean, of course, I think the story is should make a, should be a movie. It's a very it has a perfect plot. I mean, it's, it has fascinating characters. It's got all this drama. The explosion, the courtroom, the legal issues. Uh, yeah, it's got it all. That's what it would take, unfortunately, more than any book would be a movie uh, to get it out there. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yes, they were. They were. The ships, there, was, there were two ships. One was totally loaded with ammunition, and one had just docked that evening and was about to start being loaded. So some of the sailors were aboard, some had taken leave, had a few hours off. Um, and they were all, everyone who was killed was honored and memorialized. And that's not controversial at all. And, and white and black, I think, at the time were considered heroes. Uh, and that's really what, when, when they do these memorials at, every year, I think that's really what, they, what they're focusing on, is honoring those men who gave their lives. And then this other story has kind of become a bigger part of that. No, no, the Navy did a really, they, they investigated what happened, and basically what you can see in the report is that they just couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. They don't know what happened, but the guys... They, they actually, of course, they blamed the sailors. They just said their, their term was rough handling, rough handling of ammunition. So they just kind of blamed the sailors themselves. They must have made some kind of mistake. But no one knows um, exactly what... It would have only taken a very small explosion to set off this bigger explosion, which seems to be what happened. There seemed to have been a smaller one and then a bigger one a couple of seconds later. But in terms of what exactly happened, no one's been blamed for it specifically, though generally they did put the blame, of course, on the young sailors without knowing exactly. Yeah, they weren't there to defend themselves. Exactly right. Well, it happened several decades later when the Navy got together and tried to get back on the Right. Interesting, yeah. They, they did a report, which is available, an inquiry about the explosion, but they, this is also just a sign of the times. They didn't interview the sailors. They only interviewed officers. So they really didn't find out, maybe didn't want to find out exactly what happened. I don't know, or didn't want 
they did exonerate the, the, the officers. They said, oh, racing between divisions had nothing to do with it. And, and so they kind of put that in the report just to exonerate the officers, I suppose. Yeah, that could be. It could be. One of them was, uh, t that came out in the trial. It's funny you say that because the, the, the lieutenant of, the div of Joe Small's division was, I think he was the son-in-law of, the, ma of who, the guy who was assigned to be prosecutor, essentially. And that, that didn't come out. They, the, Thurgood Marshall found it out, and he tried to take it to the press. They said, nobody, uh, yeah, nobody did or said anything about it other than, than Marshall. And uh, they tried to get that out there, but it, it was just yet another one of those things, like just what you're saying. Well, thank you. you have, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks.